गुड मॉर्निंग मैम गुड आफ्टरनून यस गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी टुडे आई विल बी यू नो टॉकिंग टू यू अबाउट फाइल मार्चोडा and uh, its general characteristics the classification of it what are the different kind of uh, sub classes the sub phylum that are present and then you know we are going to just you know have going uh, we are going to have a brief look at onychophora that is the peripetes or the walking worm then the affinities and then uh, economically important insects so when it comes to phylum arthropoda it is the largest group in the animal kingdom it has the most number of creatures that are present comprising all of the invertebrates as well as the vertebrates around 78 to 80% of all the known animals are there in phylum arthropoda only so of this again you have around 8 lakh 70000 species only which are insects so class insecta is the biggest 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 group that is there so insects are the only invertebrates that have the capacity for flight also so that means that you know that house flies mosquitoes they are all insects and they are the only group of invertebrates which can fly and the most important factor regarding arthropods is that you know they have the capacity to adapt themselves to the uh, like you know situation or to the circumstances around them so this is known as adaptive radiation so because of which they can live in almost all kinds of environments that are present so they can inhibit fresh water sea cree sea sulfur springs even hot springs deserts you name it there are all arthropods present all over the uh, earth in fact there is no place on the earth where arthropods are not present and some of the, some of them live as parasites endoparasites ectoparasites for that matter and then some of them are very highly organized for example honey bee they are also known as social insects they have their own bee hive bee swarm and they are extremely important for us in fact you know if at all the honey bees getting extinct the whole world gets extinct in 4 years that is for sure you can actually go through that uh, you know that kind of theory that's come, uh, that's come up so anyway they also play an important role in our economy because you know they have you know your crustaceans that is prawns shrimps lobsters they are basically food for us honey is food for us and lac and uh, silk worm etc give us commercially important products and at the same time there are harmful uh, like you know arthropods also present which are actually going to uh, you know they are the plague locusts pests in fact so anyway there's a lot of diversity in this particular group when when we come to the uh, like you know respective uh, features of all the arthropods you have an external exoskeleton that is there for a support and arthro means jointed poda means foot so all the foot is jointed so because of the presence of jointed appendages they are known as arthropods head can be uh, like you know the body regions can be cephalothorax that is head thorax is fused together and abdomen is se separate or else it can be a separate head thorax and an abdomen and all the arthropods one feature is there that the exoskeleton that is present they start molting molting is also known as ecdysis so that they shed this exoskeleton for that matter and then when it comes to gaseous uh, like you know and the prom uh, the body is divisible into these three distinct regions they are known as tagmata process of formation of the tagmata is known as the tagmatosis like i told you they are the head uh, thorax and abdomen and uh, then you know you also have the appendages and the exoskeleton that is made up of chitin and a deposition of lime salts and sclerotin basically and then you have a locomotion in the form of either separate plates or sclerites and uh, each segment has a dorsal and ventral and two lateral sclerites that is tergum sternum and pleura respectively and they are connected to each other with the arthroidal membranes which is an important feature in this particular group and exoskeleton again i told you ecdysis and molting is seen it is shed off periodically and you have the segments they are jointed they are known as uh, podomias and they are jointed by arthroidal membrane 
and then musculature is striped or striated muscle and unstriped or un unstriated muscles and muscles in the thorax of insects help in the movement of wings true coelom is total, uh, like you know very much reduced and this head body of the adult is filled with blood or hemocoel and you also have the elementary canal we'll come to that in some time uh, when we come to the uh, respiration you get to see that it is either by gills tracheal tubes or book lungs for gaseous exchange and then you have very good sensory uh, uh, system wherein you know you have simple eyes and compound eyes and a good number of brains and many type of ganglia is also present you also again have the circumpharyngeal esophageal connectives ventral nerve cord and double and gangliated nerve cord so again in the sense organs apart from the simple compound eyes uh, you have antenna antennules and then the squam of the antenna and statocysts are the balancing organs so good uh, and uh, the compound eyes are actually called as the omotidia or ocelli and they have or they exhibit a very unique feature which is the mosaic vision again when it comes to uh, communication and uh, uh, so what happens is they communicate with the help of different kinds of uh, please give me a moment please right i'll come back to communication later so when it, uh, so what ha what exactly happens is in the case of communication they release a hormone which is known as pheromones and then bees for example do a particular kind of dance basically it's known as round dance waggle dance the scientists you know uh, corresponding to whoever had actually uh, discovered this particular feature had won a nobel prize regarding the same so this is about communication and when it comes to uh, the excretory system you have different kinds of excretory systems such as uh, malpighian tubules green glands or antennary glands coxal glands and then one feature which is very uh, you get to see is that you know there are no uh, cilia or flagella present in this particular phylum internal fertilization open circulatory system complete digestive system mouth to anus and extremely efficient means of waste excretion in fact a lot of conservation of water is seen because of the amount like you know the kind of environments it's presented and and when it comes to the um, uh arthropods you get to see that they are unisexual there is sexual dimorphism that is male and female are different gonads gonoducts are usually paired fertilization is internal development can be direct or indirect and indirect has quite a number of larval forms also present and you have something called as metamorphosis which is seen over here so what happens is the the eggs that are hatched you know the eggs they undergo you know uh, uh, the young ones are known as the larva and they undergo the uh, like you know to uh, to become the pupa and then this pupal form turns into the adult so there is a lot of uh, metamorphosis that is seen basically and a lot of changes seen in the uh, like you know the young ones and the newly hatched are similar to adult in the size color absence of wings and reproductive organs and they are also known as nymphs so you can see that this is seen in uh, 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 the grasshopper the cockroaches etc and then you have again this metamorphosis can be complete or incomplete depending upon the organism that is involved and uh, when it comes to complete you get to see that the stages are eggs larva that is a caterpillar form or grub pupa and the adult yeah. so and some of this is seen in mosquitoes house flies butterflies honey bees etc otherwise you know you can see in aphids there is you know parthenogenicity that is seen so um, uh, we'll come back to that later yeah. and some arthropods also show some parental care so eggs are carried on uh, uh, along with the mother or the parent till they are hatched so this is seen in animals such as the uh, scorpion now when it comes to the phylum i request you all to mute yourselves please so when it comes to the uh, classification is uh, so uh, like you know we are following a particular uh, uh, like you know method of uh, classification wherein that which was proposed by marshall and williams or because of which arthropoda is 
divided into seven subphyla. File yes. subphylum Onychophora, tar subphylum mm. Tardigradia, Pentastomedia, Trilobita morpha, Shellisterata, Pycnogonidia, and Mandibulata. <coughs> so again, when it comes to the subphylum Onychophora, this is known as the connecting link between uh, annelids and the arthropods. So it has annelids, arthropods, and also a few of the molluscan features. So this is a connecting link. We are going to just, you know, look into it a little while later. So meanwhile, let us just like, you know, continue with the lesson. So in this uh, subphylum, you get to see that, you know, it's uh, bo the body is like cylindrical, soft, absence of external segmentation. Uh, and all of these, in fact, you know, the different kinds of appendages present are unjointed. So difference between... Uh, uh, like, you know, there is a difference in the segmentation and there is a, uh, like, you know, a presence of unjointed legs present and at the same time, different kinds of uh, uh, appendages which rise from the ventrolateral side from the trunk, around 14 to 43 pairs are there and a pair of pants are there and then you get to see that the body cavity is a hemocele divided into only one pericardial, one central, two lateral compartments. And trachea oh. spiracles are present for respiration. Nephridia is present of which close uh, coxal or crural glands. And uh, they, uh, they serve the excretory purpose, in fact. And nervous system has okay. suprapharyngeal ganglia, two yeah. circumpharyngeal connectives, a pair of lateral longitudinal nerve cords. And again, sexes are separate, so sexual dimorphism is seen. Ovipositors are present in the females, and eggs have a lot of yolk. And also, you have some viviparis, that is, they give birth to the young ones, and each part of the oviduct is specialized as a uterus. Eggs developed inside the uterus, and there is a placenta-like structure called as a trophoblast, and developing embryos receive nutrients from this trophoblast. This is the uh, example that is peripetus or the periopterus. Now, when it comes to the subphylum tardigrade, you they are known as the bare animal cutes. So these are the different kinds of uh, phyla. Uh, in fact, over here, it is given as four subphyla, but in your textbook, we are going to follow your textbook for obvious reasons. It is seven subphyla. So you just like, you know, anyway, you please have a look at this particular um, PPT also, you just get your information basically. So, page number 180, you can just follow that. And I request you all, unless and until you have some doubt, don't uh, unmute. Right. So, anyway, it is page number 180. Subphylum tardigrade, also known as bare animal fuel, so water bearers. Uh, no proper segmentation or body division is seen basically. Anterior end has a retractile mouth, teeth, etc. Again, sexes are separate. And uh, the parthenogenesis is common in this subphylum. Development is direct. So direct from egg to adult is seen. That is known as the direct development. Example is Echinoscus and Macrobiatus, Biotus and Hypsibius. So you can see the different uh, parts are uh, labeled. And the third one is the subphylum Pentastomida or Lingua tulida. So lingua, anything uh, related to lingua means, lingua means tongue basically. So you have a subject or a topic known as linguistics that actually you know, tells you about the origin of uh, our languages for that matter. So anyway, anything regarding ling lingua tulida means they're known as tongue worms. Parasitic animals live in the lungs, nasal passages of vertebrates like snakes, dogs, foxes, etc. Around 70 species are there. Again, body is worm-like, unsegmented, cephalothalax and an elongated abdomen. And because of the presence of only five pro short protuberances near the mouth, it's known as pentastomedia. Elementary canal is simple, straight, respiratory, circulatory, excretory, sense organs are all absent. Nervous system simple, similar to that of analytes and arthropods, that is double ventral or ventral nerve cord with ganglia present. So again, it is dioecious internal fertilization and uh, embryonated eggs are passed along out, out of the feces of the host. And there is an intermediate host, usually an herbivorous animal. And you get to see that, you know, there is a lot of uh, a malting or ectysis present in the intermediate host. Example, cephalobena and lingatuola. Porocephalus pentastomium. 
Now the third, like you know, we are coming to the fourth subphylum that is Trilobita morpha. Again, they are extinct group. They used to be present in the Paleo Paleozoic uh, era, abundantly present in fact, and then they they were highly uh, evolved or present during the Cambrian and the Ordovician periods. And by the time it was Carboniferous era, they all became extinct. So bodies again oval, dorsoventrally flattened, having head, thorax, pygidium. And you can get to see that the head has a carapace or a cephalic shield. And this is uh, known as a glabella, in fact, that elevated region of the carapace. And then, you know, the all the appendages except the first pair were the biramus, meaning, uh, you know, they uh, like, you know, they're uh, having two two rami or the feet, basically. And uh, all the segments of thorax and pygidium except the telson, that is the last abdominal segment, have a pair of abdominal, a pair of appendages. Head has antennae, four pairs of biramus, that is two times like or divi, divi, uh, like you know, div, div, divided maxillipeds, a pair of compound eyes, true jaws are not present, book gills, lungs, book lungs, trachea are the respiratory organs, indirect development with different larval forms are as miraspis and holaspis. Example is triarthris, megalaspis and phacops. Now when it, we come to the uh, subphylum Shelicerata, body is divided into prosoma or cephalothorax and opistosoma. So prosoma, opistosoma. Again, opistosoma is divided into pre-abdomen that is anterior mesosoma and posterior or post-abdomen metasoma. And six pairs of jointed appendages on the cephalothorax. So they are the chelicerae, they are the pedipalps and four pairs of walking legs. And antennae, mandibles are absent. Pedipalps used are, uh, for tactile, that is touch. Receptors or raptorial organs, that is for uh, uh, holding on. Mouth, elementary canal for uh, sucking the food. Respiration through book gills, book lungs, etc. Or trachea. Excretion through malfeasion tubules. And you have even coxal glands or both of them. And uh, there are tactile bristles present all over the body dioecious or uh, 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 like you know dioecious organisms and uh, you have sexual uh, like you know fertilization internal mostly oviparous some of them are viviparous development can be direct or indirect with the larval stage and two classes are there that is merostomata and arachnida now class arachnida is one of the most important classes that we get to see uh, so you can get to see that uh, and uh, uh, Pycnogodia is uh, gonidia is also uh, present in this because of the presence of chelicerae on the first appendages. So when it comes to this uh, chelicerata, the first class is merostomata, and they're all exclusively marine. Uh, again, body prosoma and posterior opistosoma and mesosoma has around six segments, and dorsally prosoma is convex in nature, covered by a horseshoe-like car carapace, basically. And there are two lateral compound eyes, two median simple eyes are present on this carapace. And then because the first pair is called a chelicerata, uh, chelicerae, they are three segmented and chelate. Next four pairs are walking legs. La last pair is not chelate. And mesosoma has five to six pairs of lamelliform appendages. They form the, uh, like, you know, they unite in the middle. They form a genital op opercular. And then respiratory organs are book gills or uh, like, you know, book gills. And excretory organs are coxal glands. And uh, there is a free swimming larval stage called as the trilobite larva. And again, example is Limulus, which is the king crab. And it it was it's it's a very old uh, uh like you know group existing for a from a long time in fact more than two hundred years of uh, like million years ago from that time there's not much of change or evolution in this particular group so they are also known as living fossils so they some of them may include it in Xiphysura also and except Limulus all the others have perished or they are extinct now when it comes to class Arachnida. They include the scorpions, spiders, sticks, mites, and you know, they all are, uh, uh, they are the largest group. Spiders are the largest group of arachnids. They only have two body regions, that is a cephalothorax and an abdomen. 
they have two chelicerae so you have even poison uh, glands also present because of which they can poison the uh, prey and there are two pedipalps for sensing and handling the food the remaining four appendages help in the locomotion and uh, they also have this uh, elementary canal having uh, uh, what do you call it a lot of diverticular present and the opisthosoma part has pectines and a pair of spinnerets in the spiders. So the spinnerets help in sp spinning or making the spider web basically. They are the spinning glands. So tracheae, book lungs, book gills are the respiratory organs. Again, heart is tubular, elongated dorsal. And uh, excretory organs are the malphigian tubules. And they're mostly unisexual. Genital aperture is single, opens midventrally on the first abdominal segment, internal fertilization. Most of them are oviparous. Some of them are viviparous and development is direct. Examples are again house scorpion, that is butus, pelimenus, that is the field scorpion, shellifer, that is the pseudoscorpion, lycosa, spiders, again different kinds of spiders. And then sarcoptus, which is the itch mite, ixodus, which is the ticks. So you have got some more information as given in your, uh, like, you know, what do you call it? Uh, 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 the PPT. So when it comes to the another subphylum that is the Pycnogonida or the Pantopta, again small marine spider-like arthropods, so they're known as the sea spiders, usually found at the bottom of the sea at different depths. Again body has cephalothorax, thoracic segments and a rudimentary abdomen that is you know not exactly functional and somewhat like you know old in nature. And cephalothorax has a proboscis or a rostrum at the end, and this has a suctorial mouth. Prosoma has around seven pairs of appendages, and uh, then you know the intestine is extensive, long, a lot of diverticular present. Respiratory, excretory organs are not present. Nervous system has a brain, subesophageal ganglia, and sexes are separate. Sexual dimorphism is seen again, and then you know you have uh, uh, like you know indirect larva, uh, similar to that of the donopleus larva. And they are present in the Arctic and the Antarctic regions. So it's known as the nymphon. Now again, we have another subphylum that is the mandibulator. In this, you have all the animals or organisms invertebrates with mandibles and antennae. So mandibles are the parts which help in eating basically. So again, terrestrial or aquatic, both fresh marine. Body is divided into uh, cephalothorax and abdomen. And... Uh, or it can also be head, thorax, and abdomen. Again, mandibles, maxillae, antennae are all present. Compound eyes are present. Trachea or gills are respiratory organs. Malphigian tubules, cream glands are excretory organs. Uh, development can be direct or indirect. Again, six different classes. Class crustacei, class poropoda, class uh, diplopoda, class chylopoda, symphyla, insecta. So when it comes to class crustacea, they're all like, you know, marine in nature, insects of the sea as they are known as. Almost 26,600 species are present. Body again, head, thorax and abdomen, different kinds of antennae are present. Uh, cephalothorax is covered or partly or fully by a carapace. And uh, you have antennae, uh, antennae antennules, maxillae, uh, max, uh, second pair of maxillae. Then you have the protop podite and the exopodite, endopodite, which are present basically on the basal segments. And uh, this is known as a biramous appendage. All the appendages except the antennae are typically biramous. So again, most uh, more or less, it's the same kind that is present uh, featured as seen in the arthropods. So examples are pelimon, penis, pelinarius, and different kinds of like, you know, cancer, cyclops, etc. Uh, as given in your textbook. So when we come to uh, uh, what you call it, the second class that is uh, poropoda, you get to see that they live in damp places. They again have uh, a head and a trunk. So again, uh, antennae, mandibles, maxillae, all of them are present. You also have pseudo ocelli present in this particular class. Respiratory system is not exactly present. It is degenerate, trachea are absent. Circulatory system is poorly developed, heart is absent. And example is poropus. Decaporopus, Brachioporopus, Urparopus. When it comes to classes Diplopoda and Chylopoda, you get to see that this is the centipedes and millipedes, respectively. So centipedes are carnivorous and uh, they feed on different kinds of uh, arthropods, snails, slugs, slugs worms, etc. 
and their bite is very painful to human beings and they have malpighian tubules for excretion tracheal tubules for uh, gaseous exchange millipedes for uh, eating the uh, dead ah, and then stink glands for uh, uh, scaring the predators so like i told you again scolopendras cutigera these are the uh, examples you also have one more thing that is the class insecta like i told you again they are known as the hexapods and because of the presence of six legs i request you all to please mute your sets right. you also have a class please mute your sets your class uh, the fifth class is class symphyla they are known as the garden centipedes again terrestrial and uh, because they present under the stones or you know they avoid lights and all they are known as the garden centipedes and present antennae mandibles and then you know each segment is like you know around 12 segments are present you have a terminal segment having a pair of cerci which are ducts of spinning glands and uh, example is cutigerella scolopendrella and you see if you come to the last class that is class insecta you get to see that in class insecta you have uh, the the largest groups most successful in fact and uh, females lay eggs and there is either complete metamorphosis or incomplete metamorphosis so eggs complete means eggs larva pupa and adult and incomplete means you can see it in the picture it is eggs nymph and adult so nymphs compete compete with the adults for a uh, same uh, resources except for the fact that they do not have the sexual glands or they are not exactly sexually mature so that's the difference in the uh, insects basically in between nymphs and uh, the adults and you get to see they are the uh, like largest uh, pair or, or like you know class of uh, like you know arthropods that are present and examples are lepisma that is silver fish cockroaches honey bees you name it all the scientific names are also given in your textbook lepisma periplanata apis mellifera anopheles pediculus cimex bombyx mori musca domestica all of these are your um, insects so when it comes to uh, onychophora you get to see that in onychophora that is uh, it is a peripetus that is the walking worm basically you get to see that it is having annelidin as well as arthropodin as well as molluscan affinities so when it comes to the uh, so and also it is an example for discontinuous distribution that is it is present in random places so that's what they mean so when you see the annelidin features you get to see that it is vermiform having truncated ends then there is no true head present body has a thin cuticle present elementary canal is straight and simple appendages are hollow unjointed uh, slime coxal glands and the fridae are paired present in each segment uh, muscles are smooth or unstriated and cilia are present when it comes to the arthropodan features you see that you know there are present presence of antennae no. there is a cuticle that is made up of chitin it is an uh, arthropodan feature and then uh, jaws are modified appendages they are provided with striped uh, muscles locomotion is by the legs and appendages are clawed now true coelomys have is only in presence in the uh, present in the excretory and the reproductive organs body cavity has a hemocoel <clears throat> and then respiratory system is by tracheal tubes and a large brain colorless blood nephridia opens through nephrostomes all of these are arthropodan characteristics when it comes to molluscan features you get to see that molluscan features include that you know uh, uh, the slug like appearance and then the ladder like nervous system as seen in the uh, class uh, like you know in the blackophores and the prosobranchs so and then when it comes to the onychophoran characteristics which are like you know specific not uh, that is only the annelid and arthropod but not found in any other arthropod for that matter that is distinct segmentation of the body which is not present velvety skin antennae are similar to the antennae of the arthropods but they are not homologous three segments present uh, uh, like you know as seen in the head of the arthropods and annelids and simple uh, segments uh, behind the head and they are similar for that matter restricted jaws to one single pair anterior they move in the anterior posterior uh, direction presence of spiracles and two ventral nerve cords for that matter but no two true ganglia 
and eye structure is simple, whereas in arthropods it is complex. Arrangement of the reproductive organs differs from the other uh, arthropods. So this part, onychophora, you might get it in the long answer also. So you will have to look at it, the onychophora affinities. That is annelidin affinities, arthropodin and the onychophoran and the molluscan affinities. So this is an important question. And the taxonomic position also, if you see, you know, they are like, you know, much closer to the arthropods as compared to the annelids. So based on this, mantan, etc., you know, they have placed onychophora within the arthropoda, papoda as a subphylum as such. So discovery of the specimens of Ascia in the mid, uh, like, you know, which were present during the mid Cambrian uh, period also uh, had kind of given the same, uh, like, you know, conclusion that, you know, onychophora should be placed in the arthropoda family. Now, when it comes to the insects, uh, which are of productive importance, you get to see that economically important, uh, uh, like insects are the silkworm, honeybee and the lac insects. So in the silkworm, this is the kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, life cycle as seen. The eggs, the female moth lays tiny eggs. This uh, comes out as caterpillars. Again, caterpillars, you know, start eating the leaves. They are present on the silk uh, or the mulberry tree, basically. So we have silk fiber that is coming from the larva of the silk moth, which is Bombyx mori. Present in Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, but even Assam has a very good, uh, uh, you have the moga silk, the eddy silk, you have quite a number of um, different kinds of silk also present. We know the tusser silk for that matter, then uh, you name it, you know, you're like, you know, extremely good, uh, like, you know, a kind of silk that you get to it. Anyway. So the larval forms eat the, uh, what do you call it, the leaves, the silk, uh, like, you know, the mulberry trees leaves. We have, again, four molds in it. Caterpillar spines forms a cocoon of silk threads around itself. Inside the cocoon, the caterpillar changes into a pupa. And then, uh, uh, then this gets unwound. So you get the silk from the pupil. So you have to put it in the hot water. And then that's uh, like, you know, extraction of silk basically as uh, seen, uh, it's given in your textbook. So, so the salivary glands of the silk worm are transformed into the silk glands. They have uh, silk proteins, which are fibroin and sericin that are produced. And through the spinneret, it comes out and then it forms the, uh, like, you know, what do you call it? The pupa or the chrysalis. So inside this, it undergoes metamorphosis. That is, it becomes into the adult moth. And after it is broken, this is the silk moth that comes out. And then you get uh, like, you know, again, the same process gets continued. So if nowadays they're trying to extract silk from the, like, you know, after the uh, silk moth has come out of the uh, pupa, or the like, you know, the cocoon, but usually they put the cocoon into the hot water and then they extract or remove, or, like, you know, unwind the silk thread. So it, it involves, you know, killing the silkworm basically. So they're trying not to do that anymore. Anyway, so sericulture is a very, very important and economically uh, helpful uh, profession for that matter. And they only grow on mulberries, which is a deciduous plant growing in tropical, tropical and temperate climates. Morus alba is a popular species for that matter. And uh, Japan is the largest producer of silk, accounts for around 53% of the world's silk production. The rest of the countries follow next. Now, when it comes to honeybees, we also have honeybees. Let me just see where honeybees are. Right. So, in honeybees, let me see if I've got that particular. So life cycle of honeybees also, it's the same thing. It's one of the most important, uh, uh, like, you know, establishment and, you know, thing. It is used for uh, a lot of uh, honey is used in medicine, food, you name it, it's it's there. And uh, the, uh, again, the honeys are a highly organized division. You get to see presence of queen bee, worker bee, drones. And queen bee is the only sexually productive female capable of laying around 2,000 eggs. It's the biggest uh, of the lot uh, uh, in the colony, basically. Feeds only on royal jelly, can survive up to five years. And uh, that's how it is. And then the drones are the males. 
and they help only the fertilization of the female basically so they're also known as the kings of the colony they develop parthenogenetically that is from the unfertilized eggs that is laid by the uh, uh, the female uh, the queen bee and they take around 24 days to develop and there are around 500 to 1000 in number basically large eyes and uh, different kinds of uh, productive organs are also present basically and worker is the smallest produced from the fertilized eggs developed from the egg to adult in 21 days lifespan is around 6 uh, weeks all perform outdoors or indoor activity are by this worker honeybees only again this is the kind of different uh, structures this is present so because of which honeybees are more special presence of wax gland pollen basket long proboscis strong wings powerful sting for that matter so this is how it is with a full pollen basket this is how the honeybee appears and uh, workers have a lot of uh, 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 special duties you have to maintain a nursery build the uh, like you know uh, hive basically repair the hives clean, keep the hives clean and uh, then uh, you know uh, they have to protect the eyes etc so a lot of uh, like you know work is done by the worker bees which are female and in, when it comes to the life cycle of the bees you get to see that egg larva pupa is there then you have a capped pupal cell and then a new adult is there so this new adult turns into a new a nurse bee is also known as a nurse bee and then from there it becomes a foraging that is you know it goes and sucks the nectar from day 23 to 42 this is how it is so the queen also takes a nuptial flight followed uh, followed by the drones receives the spermatophores stores them in the spermat uh, spermatheca fertilization takes place Queens lay a lot of eggs in the brood cell. And queen bee also is able to lay unfertilized eggs out of which the drones come out. So this is how the eggs are present in the brood cells. This is how the honeybee pupa is. And this is how the life cycle is. From the queen bee laying the cell to the adult bee leaving the cell. So each member of the colony des uh, develops as an adult and then they become full grown. This is around 21 days it takes. So this is how the adult honeybees look, worker, queen and drone. So when it comes to the, uh, like, you know, you see this honey is used as an important uh, medicine, basically. Let me see. Um, yeah. And it has, it is therapeutic, antiseptic, can treat gastric ulcers. And it is used for a lot of medicines, nutritional value, cosmetic value. And uh, they help in improving the environment. And uh, besides providing honey wax, they also help in agriculture and horticulture because they are the biggest pollinators. And certain orchids do not, uh, like, you know, cannot be grown unless and until there is a honeybee to pollinate it. So this is all about honeybees. Now I'll come back to the other uh, slide, which is the life cycle of lac insect. So India is the biggest producer of lac, but for that matter, from the Lacifera laca, which is uh, produces the bulk uh, uh, fat of the uh, lac. So this is how the life cycle of the lac insect is basically egg larval form to the pupal form. And then you have the male and the female cells that come out because of which you have different adult male, adult female. Fertilization life is around only 62 to 92 hours. So once this is done, you know, around uh, 150 to 180 larval uh, larvae are uh, all seen. And then you have a lac cell that secretes this uh, uh, glands and all that. In fact, that secretes the lax. And then um, their uh, uh, sex is readily recognized at the early stages itself uh, because of the shape of the cells, basically. Male lac cell is uh, like a slipper like and uh, female cell is different for that matter. And the male lives only for around 62 to 92 hours after the emergence. So what happens is around 100 species of plants have this lac insects have been recorded. But they are usually found on butia, monosperma, zizifus, uh, species, ficus. And all on these, uh, of like you know, which are present on the, uh, like you know, on which the lac is uh, produced. So this lac is produced, and then you know what do you call it? It is scrapped, grinded, uh, left for uh, uh, exposed to the sun. It is called as a seed lac. It is subjected to melting, color, and the chemicals are added, and then you have the shell lac that is present. So this is how it is: seed lac, uh, shell lac, stick lac. 
the original or what is uh, formed and then that is turned into this button black so this is the insects that like you know now we get to see the what are the insects that are beneficial to land that like you know to man insects are the pollinators they act as scavengers they are helpful in pest control for that matter aphids ground beetles wasps etc etc you know they are uh, eaten by ladybird uh, beetles so what happens is you know harmful uh, insects are eaten by the beneficial insects simple and then you know you produce the dyes for that matter tannin cochineal uh, crimson lake are all from the uh, dead bodies of uh, certain scale insects so that live on cacti and when it comes to the different kind of harm that is caused by insects this is also known to you there are crop pests stored grain pests household pests and they you know they transmit diseases you know our, our hero malaria that is uh, like you know that is uh, protozoan disease uh, you know which is uh, helped by uh, to transmit by uh, like you know the uh, mosquito so that is one thing and then you have you have read about the different kinds of protozoan uh, uh, like you know diseases which uh, in which you know the bot flies for that matter or uh, like you know trypanosoma gambiense that is the african sleeping sickness all of these different insects as act, act as the vectors and then you have termites also which help in you know like you know spoiling all the wood that is present uh, so when it comes to crop pests there are a lot of crop pests that are present so the insects that are there that cause damage to the crops are known as the crop pests so the uh, 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 the insects that are the nephrotetics that is the indian dry leaf hopper then leptocorisa then you have uh, mistriola you all uh, this is there in page number 195 in your textbook so you can just go into it the leaf of hopper what are the different kinds of usually it's paddy wheat sugarcane cotton potato all different kinds of uh, like you know most of the crops rosacea is a insect that actually uh, uh, like you know attacks the mangoes plums papaya the fruit trees for that matter and then pistil that is the apple bug nicias which is you know different kinds of fruit trees so you have fruits crops and vegetable plants all of them being in uh, like you know uh, affected by different kinds of uh, insects present so the kind of damage that is done you know because of which you know the crop becomes a little less so you have insecticides for the same reason so this is all about arthropoda i will like you know now right now start the uh, pelemon which is the freshwater crab please give me one minute let me start yes i need so in pelemon pelemon the body parts or the appendages are all very important for you they are going to come for you for uh, your exam you can expect a question from pelemon structure of the gills of pelemon has been asked in the short answer and body parts of pelemon has been asked for uh, the what do you call it um, uh, your long answers for that matter so just give me one minute i will try to uh, take out the prawn and different kinds of uh right i will be mostly following the uh, uh what do you call it uh, the uh, the powerpoint or the slide the document that i'm showing so this is much more uh, like you know easier for you to understand also just share share the screen with you right this is all about pelemon you get to see so when you get to see the different kind the history of it the habitats it is a freshwater uh, uh it is present in freshwater streams rivers lakes so it's a freshwater creature common prawn indian uh, species are uh, pelemon malcolmsoni carcinus ide rudis lamerae so you have all of these in fact you know there are the indian species and it is a large uh, prawn uh, pelemon carcinus around 90 cm in length which is large and the smallest prawn is pelemon lamerae which is around 2 and 1/2 cm in length so now you are going to read about pelemon malcolmsoni as given see most of it you are going to see or learn in the practicals also so once you go to the college and you know attend your zoology practicals you are going to see the specimen and when you see it in live and then you correlate corroborate with whatever you are learning 
it will be easier and you can expect a question from Pelimon for sure. So it's systematic position when you get to see again it is kingdom animalia, uh, phylum arthropoda, subphylum crustacei. Uh, again, class subphylum is different in your textbook. So subphylum mandibulata, class crustacei, subclass malacostraca, order decapoda, family penidae, uh, genus is uh, pelimor. Species can be different kinds of species. So the young ones are. Uh, translucent pale white or yellow in color for that matter older animals differ according to the different colors of uh, different colors so again it is a nocturnal creature omnivorous that is feeds on small weeds insects algae respiration is through gills uh, it is like you know the sexual mode of reproduction again it can also walk as well as swim so this is how a technical prawn looks like you can get to see So the different body parts and appendages, all of it are important. So I'm just going to keep it in this manner. So the body is again developed, uh, divided into uh, like, you know, it has the body of an adult prawn has around 19 segments, two distinct regions, anterior cephalothorax, posterior abdomen. Cephalothorax is the large, rigid, unjointed part of the body. This is the cephalothorax formed by five cephalic uh, head, that is head and eight thoracic regions. And again, in the embryo, the cephalothorax is a pre-segmental region and the first 14 segments as seen in the embryo form. But again, adult form has only around 13, each of the uh, 13 segments and each of the 13 segments is uh, having a pair of appendages also. Now, when it comes to the abdomen, it is dorsally round and compressed laterally for that matter. And it has six jointed movable uh, segments conical teslon or a tail plate. This is the conical teslon or the tail plate. And each abdominal segment has pleopods or swimmerets. So as you can wait. So this is the pleopods or the swimmerets. This I'm not able to remove it. So you'll have to adjust. And when it comes to the external approaches, you get to see that there is a mouth present, anus present, you have renal apertures present basically and then you have openings of statocysts also and then you have uh, female genital apertures and the male genital apertures. So mouth again ventrally present at the anterior end of the cephalothorax has uh, labrum, labium, metastoma stoma, and mandibles. Anus is a longitudinal slit present in the uh, base of the teslon, telson, telson sorry. Renal apertures are present and then openings of the statuses are again uh, uh, present. And uh, in each, uh, on the dorsal side, that is on the, it's also known as the precoxa, that is the basal podomias of the antel, uh, antennules. You have the female genital openings present at the third pair of the walking legs, basically, and then male on the fifth pair of the walking legs. So male and female, third and uh, fifth, you have these. And when it comes to the exoskeleton, it is um, a hard, uh, it is chitinous in nature. You have arthroidal membrane joining the appendages. Uh, and then you have a dorsal plate and the carapace, which is completely fused. So it forms a dorsal shield for that matter. And same thing has been explained. I'm just going on uh, like, you know, so that you see the picture, you can understand it in this manner itself. And then you have the dorsal plate, carapace, completely fused. And you have that is formed the dorsal uh, shield basically. And then the chitinous sclerites are present on the ventral side of the head underneath this, under here. And uh, the front uh, the, and, and uh, the, the chitinous sclerites are called as sterna. And in the third and the fourth segments, you do not have sterna present. From 5 to 13, the segments are fused and they form the floor. Sclerites of the abdominal segments, these are the abdominal segments that are present, so they are separate. They have the arthroidal membranes and the dorsal abdominal sclerite is known as the tergum or tergite. Ventral uh, 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 sclerites are known as sternum or sternite and the lateral ones are known as the pleura. You see the pleura over here, that's all. So... 
So this is the kind of appendages uh, when it comes to that. You also have an epimeron and an intertergal and intersternal arthroidal membranes. When it comes to the endoskeleton, you have an endophragmal skeleton and uh, epodemes for that matter, which is the uh, cuticle and uh, they form the endophragmal skeleton. And then you have the epibera and the sterna of the cephalothorax for the uh, attachment of the muscles. When it comes to appendages, you have quite a number of appendages. Please follow the textbook to not two uh, page number. You can get to see the different kinds of appendages. Around 19 pairs of appendages are present. And of which 13 pairs are uh, uh, cephalothoracic appendages. And uh, uh, six pairs are uh, abdominal appendages. And the uh, cephalothorax appendages are again cephalic five pairs, thoracic eight pairs. Cephalic includes the antennules, antennae, mandibles, maxillae, and um, maxillulae. And then the thoracic appendages include the maxillipedes, which are three pairs, first, second, third. And you can get to see the different kinds of function also, which is given over here. And then you have the periopods or the walking legs. They help in, they are the uh, five pairs. And they include the chelate legs, first pair, second pair, and then the non-chelate legs, which are the third pair, fourth pair, and the fifth pair. So the, append, uh, the cephalic appendages, as again, you know, I have already told you, and uh, all the cephalic appendages except the antennules are biramis. And when it comes to antennules on each side, you know, they are, you know, below the basis of the eye stalks. And they have a protopodide with three podomiers, that is precoxa, coxa, and the basis. Again, uh, dorsoventrally flattened, attached to the body, etc. And the precoxa has a stylocerite. And coxa is short cylindrical, setae are present, and basis is larger than the coxa. It has a pair of feelers in, uh, on the inner side and the outer side. And they are multi-jointed. Outer feeler is again divided into two unequal branches. Antennules act as tactile sense organs. That is touch. Whatever it touches or as since it goes on the surface, it can feel and understand what is going on. Statocysts is for the organ. It is the organ of equilibrium. Again, antennae are on one side, uh, uh, present on either side behind the antennules. Uh, uh, again, protopodite that is present is gently swollen. You, it has a podomia, spokes and basis. And you have a renal aperture, which is the excretory organ that is opening outside. And uh, the antennae help in tactile excretory uh, function and the sperma act as the balancing organs. Mandibles for food, for chewing basically. And uh, around like, you know, you have a, a proximal triangular hollow apophysis and a solid distal head. The head bears a molar prophysis for that matter. And the, uh, the it has around five to six dental plates, incisor processes, and teeth that are present. So mandibles are masticatory, that is for chewing in function. Maxillulae help in uh, directing the food into the mouth. Again, labrum, labium is present. And uh, then the protopodide helps in, uh, like, you know, basically for uh, putting the food into the mouth. Maxillae help in the food capture and respiration. Again, it is also known as the second maxillae. And you have uh, this exopodite, endopodite and exopodite, which is like uh, exopodite is like snaphognatite, which is expanded into a fan-like structure in the case of your uh, freshwater prawn for that matter. Bristles are present and uh, this helps in the maxillae help in food capture and respiration. All the thoracic appendages help for, uh, you know, what do you call it? They're tactile, respiratory in function. They help in food capturing. And uh, you have the first uh, three pairs, which are known as the maxillipedes or the foot jaws. The rest of them are called as periopods or walking legs. And uh, maxillipedes are leaf-like. So they are also known as the philopodia for that matter. And um, the first maxillipedes act as tactile, respiratory and food capturing organs. When, it's, when it comes to the second maxillipedes, you get to see that the coxa is short. You have an epipodite and a gill. So this, again, podomios are present, five of them, ischium, mirus, carpus, propodos, and dactylus. All of these are, again, useful for tactile, respiratory, and food-holding organs. You don't have this, you will have to follow your textbook for this particular uh, picture, page number 206. 
And when it comes to the third maxillipids, again, you have uh, coxa and bases that are present, the protopodite. And you get to see that endopodite and exopodite are present. So the first podomere is fused ischium and mirus. Second is carpus. Third represents the fused propodus and dactylus. The third maxillipedes are organs for holding the food, respiration and tactile sense. All of this has been explained in this particular C if you see again. So again, you know, these uh, peripods, whatever are there, they are the first uh, peripods for food capture, agnostic and mating behavior. The second, chelipeds for that matter. The third, peripods are for walking. They have the female gonopods between the bases of the legs present on the 12th segment. On the 13th segment, you have uh, uh, fourth peripods for walking. 14th for male uh, gonophores are present between the legs. And this is the fifth peripods. And uh, again, 15 to 19, you have one, two, three, pair, four, five pairs of uh, swimmer, swinerids. They are swimming and except the 16th, which is also helping in copulation. You also have on the 20th segment, uh, uh, like you know, it is jointed, also known as the telson. You have the uropods, which is helping in propulsion, uh, which is together with the central telson. So this is what is there in your, uh, uh, like, you know, the different kinds of segments. So when it comes to the body wall, it is made up of cuticle, that is epicuticle and procuticle, which is a thin outer layer and a thick out, uh, inner layer. Epidermis has a single layer of columnar cells having gland cells present on and off. And basement membrane has a single layer of flattened cells with setae and spines present in the body wall. Again, maintenance of the particular body fall. Uh, and it is an aquatic creature, so that amount of bod, uh, like uh, water present should be maintained. So it helps in the loss of water also, uh, checks that particular, uh, so that it prevents the water loss. And it helps in, you know, protection of the delicate internal organs. And uh, entry of the microorganisms is also, uh, like, you know, prevented. <coughs> Excuse me. Helps in respiration, outgrowth, forms a sensory defense and feeding apparatus. So this is how the digestive system of the uh, particular uh, paleomon is, if you get to see. Uh, so this is the eye stalk. Uh, yeah, when it comes to the musculature again, you have the cuticle, epicuticle, endocuticle and epidermis and dermis is what is there. So again... Uh, endocuticle helps, uh, like, you know, has uh, chitin, right? So this is uh, uh, where from which the adult prawn casts off this cuticle once a year. And this is, again, this phenomenon is known as malting or egg diasis. And epidermis has columnar cells. I have already told you that particular part. When it comes to the musculature, you get to see that a body is made up of different kinds of muscles. Two categories, extensor and flexor. Extensor from the six abdominal segments and telson. So you have seven pairs of extensor muscles. And uh, then they help in the contraction of the muscles so that, you know, the abdomen is straightened and extended. That is why it is known as extensor. Flexor means it is present in the first five abdominal segments. Extend ventrally, inserted into inserted on the sterna epidermis thoracic wall, responsible for bending of the abdomen. So they help in the movement of the limbs, basically. You also have a coelom, which is not lined with epithelium. So the true coelom is only present in the excretory or, uh, or like and the reproductive organs. So when it comes to the digestive system, you have uh, it's a complete digestive system, and uh, you also have hepatopancreas present. So, alimentary canal right from mouth to anus is present. You have a foregut, a mouth, which consists of mouth, buccal cavity, and esophagus and stomach. Lobes of the labium form the paragnatha for that matter. The mouth opens into the buccal cavity. And the buccal cavity is short, anterior, posteriorly compressed over here. And uh, then you get to see that uh, from the inside, molar processes of the mandibles are present. And uh, buccal cavity opens into the esophagus. This is the esophagus present. It is short, wide, opens into the stomach. And uh, they are into four folds, the muscles basically. So this is the in the lumen of the esophagus. Again, each is subdivided into two smaller unequal folds. So that produce the from the lateral grooves. Short bristles are present on the cuticular lining. And when it comes to the stomach, you have, a, a, you know, this is the stomach of the uh, um, uh, the crab, freshwater crab, you have hepatopancreas also present in it, which uh, surrounds the stomach except on the dorsal side. It is divided into cardiac stomach and posterior pyloric stomach. 
So cardiac stomach, uh, stomach is stack-like in nature and uh, pyloric stomach has um, uh, 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 like, you know, what do you call it? Posteriorly, uh, it below, uh, it is like uh, posterior to the cardi cardiac stomach. So cardiac stomach again is lined by cuticle or intima having different kinds of longitudinal folds and the structures in the cardiac stomach include um, The circular cuticular plate, lanceolate plate, hastate plate, each has a different part altogether. The lateral grooves and then the groove plate, then you have chitinous rods, ridged plate, combed plate, etc. You can see the picture uh, 9.22 in your textbook for that matter. So all these help in uh, digestion for that matter. And um, when it comes to, you also have the cardiopyloric aperture and walls that are present. And the pyloric stomach, for that matter, is a small and a narrow, has a ventral chamber and a, 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 a like you know small dorsal cham chamber, for that matter. So when you get to see when it comes to the digestive glands, you have hepatic CK also present. So this alimentary canal has around uh, has a stomadium, mesenteron, and proctadium, and digestive glands consisting of two separate lobes called a hepatic cica. So when it comes to digestion, intake is by uh, cephalothoracic appendages. Then the mandibles cut the food into small pieces and then it is passed to cardiac uh, and pyloric stomach. Digestion is by hepatopancreas and then absorption is also by the hepatopancreas and the intestine. Ejection, the hunger forms the fecal pellets passed out through the muscular anus. Respiratory system, Palemon takes up the dissolved oxygen that is present. I want only five minutes of your time. I want to finish this lesson. So please bear with me. So you get to see that there is bronchiostegites, epipodites, bronchi or gills that are present basically. They are all like, you know, uh, the inner lining uh, and uh, the other respiratory organs that are present. And uh, they help in taking up the oxygen from the dissolved uh, uh, water, basically, from the seawater. So when it comes to the mechanism, what happens is the scaphognathite of each maxilla, uh, like, you know, is present inside the gill chamber. With its vibrating moments, the anterior end uh, of the gill chamber gets opened. So this is supplemented by the exopodites, which helps in the opening of the maxillary peats. Then the fresh water enters into the gill chamber. There is always a current of water that is present. So this is going over the lining of the branchiostegite gills and epipodites. So gaseous exchange takes place uh, like, you know, in the blood. Then, then you have extremely thin, delicate gill plates that are present. They're excellent permeable membrane actually for the exchange of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide for that matter. And when it comes to the circulatory system, you get to see that it is the open type of circulatory system that is present. So what happens is in the circulatory system, you have heart, arteries, pericardial membrane, pericardial sinus, hemocele, blood channels, blood hemolymph, etc. Heart is triangular, which is lined by or it is in the pericardial space provided with paired openings, which are known as the ostia. And there are arteries that are present, basically, the ophthalmic artery, antenary artery, hepatic artery, sternointestinal artery. And you have the pericardial sinuses that are present in the dorsal part of the thorax. And this is where the heart is present. You also have the hemocele, which is the space in between the visceral organs that are present. This has the blood or the hemolymph. And from the gills, blood you goes to the heart through the blood channels. Blood has plasma, hemocytes of blood uh, cells, and the respiratory pigment is hemocyanin. So something similar to blue blood. So when it comes to the circulation in heart, what happens is deoxygenated blood goes into the efferent branchial artery, from there into the transverse connectives, from there into the long, lateral longitudinal channels, and then the marginal channels, and from there into the median longitudinal channels that are present to the efferent branchial channel. Please look into your textbook. You'll see this picture, this table. And from there to the pericardial sinus, and then the circulation of the blood. So hemolymph enters into the pericardial sinus, and through the ostia reaches the hemocene. Collected by the efferent blood channels, all of these are the efferent blood channels. That is the efferent art, uh, branchial artery, transverse uh, connectors, lateral longitudinal channels, etc. To the pericardial uh, sinuses. Now, when we come to the nervous system, 
you get to see that in the nervous system, quite a number of nervous system is present. In fact, for that matter, nervous system has a ganglia that is the supraesophageal ganglia, circumesophageal connectives, the nerve cord. So supraesophageal is present right beneath the base of the brain, has a pair of uh, fused uh, pair of ganglia. Circumesophageal connectives are present. Uh, they arise from the lateral parts or uh, brain and uh, pass backwards round about the esophagus and then they meet the ventral nerve cord. This nerve cord is present in uh, in the midventral line of the body, arises from the subesophageal ganglia. Around 17 pairs of ganglia are present and one belonging to each postural segment and 11 pairs uh, belonging to the uh, cephalothorax and 6 belonging to the abdomen. Again, you have quite an extensive peripheral nervous system also which consists of optic nerves, ophthalmic nerves, antinullary nerves. Uh, antennary, tegmental, mandular. So each part has a different nerve attached to it. And then the autonomic nervous system in which you have uh, like, you know, the nerves arise from behind the brain. There's two small visceral ganglia connected by the commissural ganglia, uh, which is by the circumesophageal connectives, by the transverse connectives. These give rise to two pairs of nerves to the muscles or the walls of esophagus and stomach. Again, you have compoundized statocysts that are present. And then you get to see that, uh, like, you know, the compound eyes have omatidia. And each omatidium is uh, having a cornea outermost layer and it is transparent. Externally, it is hexagonal called as the facet. Two images are formed, that is mosaic and superimposed. You have statocysts, which are organs for equilibrium and orientation, present at the basal segment of the antennules. Uh, this is for again, uh, you know, sending the uh, recept like reception to the nerves, to the nerve impulses, so that it is connected to the brain by these nerves. Again, antennae are the tactile organs and setae that are present. Many sensory setae are present, located all over the body, especially the appendages. And then you have the olfactory setae, uh, which is for the uh, like you know on the middle of the small feeler of each antennule. Now, when it comes to the excretory system, you have antennal glands and the renal uh, sac for that matter. And there is a pair of antennal or green glands and each lies in the proximal segment or the coax of the antenna has a end sac, coil tube and a bladder. This is the renal sac, which is large, blind, covers the cardiac stomach, reaches and reaches the gonad. Anteriorly, it, it can, communicates with the bladder. Then the tubular part is glandular and the bladder wall is thin, uh, the bladder is thin walled, opens to the excre exterior or outside by the excre excretory pore. So again, green glands have a good blood supply from the antennary arteries. So there is ultra filtration taking place, water and dissolved substances pass through from the blood into these enzymes and it gets filtered. This is the primary urine that is formed. This again, selective resorption takes place or, uh, and then the remaining fluid is called as the final urine, fl uh, which flows into the bladder, secreted out through the ureters and renal uh, set up by the scaphognathites. So you have osmoregulation over here, prone blood is hypertonic. So water diffuses into the blood through highly permeable gills. This is why prawn passes out of large quantities of hypotonic urine to regulate internal fluid volume. So when it comes to the reproductive system, again, you get to see that there are male uh, in this, the testes, vasa differentia, vesicule, semi, uh, seminales, and male genital openings that are present. And each uh, testes is like two testes are present in the posterior half of the hepatopancreas beneath the heart and tubular and united in the front. And there are many cecal diverticula that arise from the testes. You have the vasa differentia for that matter. And uh, uh, like, you know, they're convoluted in the middle region, narrow in the posterior region. You have the vesicule seminales, a club shaped ones basically store the spermatozoa packed in the spermatophores and male genital openings. Uh, like you know, openings of the vesicular seminales open into the male genital openings. When it comes to the female reproductive system, you have the ovaries and the oviducts and the female genital openings of which two ovaries are present, one on each side on the middle line, occupies the whole length of thorax and abdomen. Many distinct diverticula arise from these. And then you have the oviducts, which are slender, curved, and from the middle region, you have this oviduct. And the two oviducts open to the female genital openings. So when it comes to the uh, life history, you get to see that it, it has two different kinds of places wherein it uh, uh, like you know is present. So it is present in the estuarine and the ocean. Estuarine is where you know you have the fresh water and the salt water uh, meeting together. 
So what happens is in this you have the uh, juvenile forms that are present and uh, you get to see from here the juvenile forms the adult mating takes place in the ocean spawning takes place in the ocean nucleus larva is present and then you have the protozoa mysis and post larva all of these are larval for, like you know what do you call it the uh, metamorphosis uh, taking place and then you have the juvenile in the estuary from which it becomes into an adult and goes back into the ocean so the female releases the eggs in the water nucleus larva emerges from the egg passes the metanucleus protozoa mys uh, mysis post larval and uh, then it becomes into the adult again used for a lot of food as food for that matter and even what happens is the main function is that it is not restricted to only seafood but also for uh, ornaments some of them are used for jewelry buttons etc all of this for farming for that matter so it is extremely important so this is all i'm going to tell you about the uh, uh, give me one minute i'm coming so again uh, vitamins a and d are present muscles have glycogen and amino acids so this is all you're going to have about uh, 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 what do you call it paleomon that is the freshwater uh, 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 like you know prawn for that matter and you have quite an it is an important topic for you so you please you know kind of uh, prepare for your exam especially paleomon tomorrow i will deal with mollusca echinodermata and hemichordata i will be taking an extra half an hour tomorrow for sure thank you all okay thank you ma'am oh, ma